Hello, welcome to A Fine Time for Healing. I am your show host, Randy Fine, and this is a monumental event today because I've been doing A Fine Time for Healing for over 12 years. I've done over 500 shows, and they've all been audio. Today, we're starting to do them in video. All these shows will be on YouTube as well as on my Blog Talk Radio page. On the Blog Talk Radio page, they will be strictly audio. So for those of you who are used to going to that, um, going to the Blog Talk Radio page or even my website, all that will be audio. But YouTube will be will have a complete channel for a fine time for healing. So you'll be able to come and see every episode. So I'm really excited. And today I'm even more excited to bring to you our guest, Sally Norton. And let me tell you about Sally. Sally K. Norton, MPH, holds a nutrition degree from Cornell University and a master's degree in public health from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her path to becoming a leading expert on dietary oxalate includes a prior career working at major medical schools in medical education and public health research. Her personal healing experience, which she's going to tell us about, inspired years of research that led her to her book that is just coming out to, or just came out today, Toxic Superfoods, which, um, and yeah, I was gonna say, releases on, okay, perfect. As a leading expert on oxalates and foods, Sally's work has been featured by podcasters, radio shows, and several online print journals. Well, good morning, Sally, and welcome. Good morning, it's so nice to be with you, thank you. It's, it's really wonderful to have you. Uh, and as I was telling you, uh, this hits very home, very close to home for me because I have a tremendous amount of food sensitivities and it's, it impacts my life in a, in a big way. But let's start off by you telling your story so that we have an idea of where this all came from. Well, I've been a nutrition geek since I was a little child and really interested in eating well. And so I always liked my vegetables. I was a gardener by age nine. You know, I grew up in this idea that, you know, if you ate low calorie foods, because of course, everyone's worried about not getting fat. Even when you're a kid, you like don't want to be fat. <laughs> and, you know, filling up on vegetables and, you know, they're low calorie and they're good for you and they're nature and all this. So I was always into healthy eating and um, I started having health problems already when I was about 12. And they got so bad, I had to leave Cornell. I couldn't finish my nutrition degree in the normal pace because I had to leave for foot surgery. And I didn't recover from the foot surgery well. And, and it had to fill like the whole four year leave I had to take before I could go back and finish my degree. But I was still on painkillers and crutches and needing, you know, my feet still weren't good. And, I, and my health continued to be a challenge to the point where fast forward, I'm at the end of my 40s, and I'm quitting my career completely because I was so deeply fatigued and my brain was not working. I was had small fibroids that were causing massive blood loss, needing iron infusions. I ended up needing a hysterectomy. Everything in there was a mess. Apparently, I had endometriosis, and the list is ridiculously long. I started having arthritis as a kid, wow. and it was really bad in my 20s when I was a vegetarian. I shrunk during that time, an inch and a half in height. By my 40s, I now had osteopenia, which is like, wait a minute, I exercise, I eat right. Like, You do everything right and you're falling apart. That's oxalate poisoning, it turns out, but I didn't learn that in school. And so I learned it the hard, hard way. And it took three years of um, not working and struggling with a severe sleep disorder. My brain was waking up. 29 times an hour, but I didn't even know it because I'm so wiped out that it seemed like I was sleeping, but I wasn't at all. So I had this neurotoxicity going. I had digestive problems going. I thought I had SIBO. I had all these aches and pains. My brain had stopped working. My whole system was crashing on foods like sweet potatoes and Swiss chard. And I just had no idea. I was eating all these sweet potatoes because I had these food sensitivities like you have. I no longer could eat the grains, especially wheat. 
I could not eat the beans anymore. They were giving me skin outbreaks. And so I was using sweet potatoes as my favorite starch as a daily staple, like you would use toast and bread and cereal and whatever. And I thought that was a low allergy approach. Did not notice that when I picked up the sweet potato habit, I started getting wrinkles right away. I started getting knots in the back of my shoulder blades that would keep me from sleeping. It was oh like God. a knife back there. All kinds of things were happening as I adopted a daily sweet potato, but I never put the two together and for, for years. So um, I'm a train wreck, but here I am well enough to write a book, which came out today. And surprisingly, you know, when I realized this, I recognized that none of us can run to a doctor or any kind of health advisor and get told, you know what, we should think about your diet. Are you poisoning yourself because you're eating these foods that are high in oxalic acid? No one's going to have that conversation with anybody. So I thought, my gosh, it is my duty <laughs> as someone who always wanted to help people be well to start um, talking about it. And I started giving free presentations at the local health food store. And um, I was shocked. I thought I was sort of a weird breed that just some people are bothered by this. I was shocked that now it looks like all I have to do is turn around and bump into a fellow human being and have an honest conversation. And I can see that their health is also being impacted because we're eating too many of these high oxalate foods now. What is, what is an oxalate? Yeah, it's a tiny little chemical that plants make. It's actually ubiquitous in nature. So it's, it's so ubiquitous that scientists have been kind of like, yeah, it's just oxalate. So oxalic acid is the parent compound. It's a small two carbon compound. It has four oxygens in it and that's about it. It's a really small molecule that's a chelator of metals. It has this charge on it. It's negative charge, two, one or two negative charges, depending on its chemical state and environment. And it, it will attract minerals like calcium and it forms these calcium, magnesium, copper, whatever, these bonds with minerals. And then you have what's called an oxalate and oxalates, you get enough of them together in the right situation, about six, eight, 10 pairs of them. And they'll come together into a little tiny nano crystal. So it crystallizes out. Plants use that phenomenon to build specific crystals as, as defense weaponry, as a way to store calcium, does all these things for the physiology. But plants make oxalic acid and calcium oxalate crystals. And so we're, we haven't been paying attention to this, you know, which plants are really high in oxalate, even though we've had science that demonstrates it's dangerous to eat high oxalate plants since the 1930s and earlier. And we've known about oxalic acid's ability to chelate mineral, minerals since the 1700s. We've been using it as an industrial cleaner in factories since the 1700s and in home cleaners too, because it, it'll it take the rust out of your patio surface. <laughs> and the foods that are really high in it are spinach, beet greens, Swiss chard, almonds, peanuts, chocolate, things we're eating like every day, like me picking up sweet potatoes as a daily habit was much worse than eating bread every day. I was like, what? Wait. Yeah. It's so hard to figure out something like that. You know, for me, mine started, I think, when I was very young, because I know I used to have these terrible pains in my abdomen that my parents would take me to the emergency room. And um, it was always like trapped gas. And so I was eating everything. I didn't know what that was. And at around the age 19, um, I started really having reaction to everything and I got chronic fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I went to doctors, they gave me Valium because they said you're depressed. So I started on a vegetarian diet way back then on my own. But you know, it didn't really, really help. And let's and move forward. I've I've always had sensitivities to dairy. Um, what else? I don't know. So I, I a couple years ago I went gluten free, and didn't really notice any difference with the gluten free. So and I was gaining weight, and I'm like, what is going on here? Why I couldn't take it off, and I wasn't hardly eating anything. So 
<clears throat> my husband and I, my husband said to me, you know, I'd really like to try the keto diet and uh, which means getting rid of your carbs. You have to have under 50 carbs a day. And I'm like, that is my diet. <laughs> I'm all carb. But I said, okay, let's do it. So we looked into it anyway. We've been doing keto for several months, but what I found is that the recipes in, so they're substituting, but the things that they're substituting with are coconut, avocado, and almonds. I can't eat any of them. They all give me a reaction. So um, I've had to be very creative, but it's really frustrating. And so now I figured out what I can eat and I eat the same thing pretty much every day. And it's limited, but I don't want to have those reactions. For me, it's um, it's digestive. It's a cough. It's clearing my throat. It's overflow of phlegm. It's just awful. And it can go on for hours. That's very serious when your immune system is being overstimulated all the time. And that's what's happening with you. And, and sadly, even doctors will tell you it's in your head. Not, no, it's in your immune system. It's in your stomach. It's in your system is really imbalanced. And it is so hard to figure this out. Like what's bothering you. And, and like, it was so hard for me to figure out oxalates. And unfortunately the keto diet, I, I get a lot of clients who are recovering from keto damage because those almonds, the dark chocolate and the spinach that are encouraged on the keto diet, mm -hmm. they're also encouraged on the paleo diet and the gluten-free diet. And there's so many of these supposed healing diets encourage these foods that are high in oxalate and you don't notice initially that it's damaging you, but eventually it stops working completely because you're falling apart and you're getting more sleep problems, more of the things you're talking about. I mean, if, if you get, if your pain is worse, if your fatigue is worse, if your brain fog is worse, if your skin is falling apart, if you're producing more mucus, arthritis, digestive problems, fatigue, running to the bathroom all the time, that's another one kidney stones, allergies getting worse, those can all be signs of oxalate toxicity. And that's what's happening. We're literally poisoning ourselves on a plant poison. It's amazing. And I'm also, I eat seafood and fish, which I have no problem with, but other than that, that, I'm vegan. <laughs> so I don't eat dairy. I don't eat eggs. Um, you know, I don't eat meat, I don't eat chicken, you know, so my protein is very difficult for me to get protein. So now I'm getting protein through seeds and things like hemp and um, mm. sunflower. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can be very creative, but um, there I, is, but I, I have to say anyone with digestive problems has to be very careful of seeds. They're designed to be indigestible. So they have, in addition to, they're very high in oxalate, this, the plants, tend to use seeds as a, as a, well, the seed is a dormant baby and it's gonna need all it needs to be protected from digestion. So it's built to be protected by digestion. And as you'll see in the book, there's a picture of a raspberry seed. You can see the little oxalate crystals around the outside of the raspberry seed underneath the hull as part oh, of wow. protecting it, making it hard. And, and then later when the seed is germinated, it will, start dissolving the calcium oxalate. So it has the calcium molecules to, to produce proteins and so on. So when you soak those seeds, it reduces the phytic acid, which is the anti-nutrient in seeds, but it liberates the oxalic acid. So you have more of the oxalic acid coming from the crystals. So they're even potentially worse for you from an oxalate standpoint when you soak them. So it's not easy to get around the oxalates and the seed question. Now, there are some seeds that are low, pumpkin seeds and um, flax and mm -hmm. uh, sunflower aren't too bad, but it doesn't fix the phytic acid problem. So you need to soak them if you're going to use seeds. Just I a heard, warning, I, I really that, think um... that animal proteins are easier to digest. So if you can focus on the meats that you can eat, like the seafood, the sardines, right. and so on, you can I'm build a pretty good though. diet on seafood. There's a lot of choices in the seafood department. Right. Um, I heard that when, that sprouted uh, pumpkin seeds and sprouted sunflower seeds are easier to digest. Yeah. Are they, do they have as many oxalates? No, those are pretty low oxalate and they're um, easier to digest. 
that doesn't mean they're easier for you to digest though. I mean, <laughs> like I had to stop with the pumpkin seeds and all that. I don't do them anymore because my stomach really needed a break. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, planty exactly. the other fight i don't know if it's the fiber and the other plant chemicals they're really plants are chemical factories they have many many thousands of different chemicals that many of them have bad effects like the tannins that which tannin is a type of polyphenol we're told polyphenols are good but in fact they're mostly anti-nutrients and, and they're mostly a stressor that will help the body react in a like oh defensive way that can temporarily increase your antioxidants in your body but it's your body responding to a to a stressor and you're better off using sauna and running and exercise as stressors than you are plant chemicals because there's way less side effects to a good sauna <laughs> interesting um what are some other foods that we may be eating that uh we're unaware that are you know because there so there really is not something like such thing as a health food because it really just matters um well we you know we've been we've been giving plants credit for being the health foods and telling ourselves that meats are the bad foods which is completely inside out from reality. We've actually been hunting meat since before we were even human. We've, been, we've, made, and we've had fire a long time. We've been able to scavenge and hunt meat. We domesticated dogs to help us hunt meat and you know do these big barbecues in history. We'd take down a big woolly mammoth or something and have a barbecue. Like we've been doing that a long time. And that didn't create the modern diseases that exploded at the end of the 18th and 19th centuries, where we started getting more and more problems with gout and arthritis and heart disease and cancer, um, way more than we had historically. And problems with, you know, dentition. Everyone seems to need orthodontia now and these kinds of things and vision problems. Everyone needs glasses. And we're just slightly crippled and, and more imperfect than we used to be. And that's because we've invented all these factory foods, these uh, newfangled foods, but we introduced potatoes and vegetables. The whole produce department is basically human invention. We had to breed plants in order to create corn on the cob and tomatoes and potatoes and, and the whole cabbage family, which is a huge number of plant foods in the produce department. These are all pretty modern inventions and they really didn't get on the human plate till somewhere between six and 400 years ago, but humans have been around a lot longer than 400 years. And we started being able to make sugar and import these starchy foods. In nature, really, you're really more dependent on a bow and arrow to survive than you are in a refrigerator and a train and those things that we have now that produce our foods in factories. So we're, we're really eating in many ways, both from a plant selection, lowering our meats, eating more plants and eating junk food and using plants as justification for dessert and more junk food. Like, oh, eat your spinach, eat your broccoli and you can have dessert mentality is putting us squarely in the processed sugar-based foods that, and we're using toxic vegetables in order to justify those processed foods. And that combination is not working. It's very frightening, you know. It is from a public your, health standpoint. I'm frightened yeah, for all of yeah. us. Even, um, you know, even if we're doing organic, that's not going to take yeah. away what you're saying. Yes, no, it will it take doesn't. away the pesticides, but it's not going to take away the oxalates. Um, yes. So I guess I didn't really fully answer your question about which other foods have the oxalates. So. Okay. The, there's okay the nuts are not great so nuts as a group are not so great especially want you to think about avoiding almonds cashews and peanuts okay. um, and there's just the three dark leafy greens of spinach chard and beet greens the other greens are, are low in oxalate not a problem okay. beans aren't good like black beans and white beans so you're kind of stuff that you put on burritos or the baked beans, those are not so good, but peas are much better. We're in the season of the black eyed pea at the new year. So that's a nice low oxalate bean okay. type thing. The, the peas, green peas are fine in reasonable portions. You can start living on mountains of these foods, like <laughs> normal little portions. Right. And then bran is so dark, any bran, all the brands are pretty high in oxalate. So your, your seeded breads that are full of seeds and brands additives, those are pretty high. And then you want to look at these pseudo grains that are so great for the gluten-free and paleo diets where you're doing quinoa, teff, buckwheat. Those are really high in oxalate. The chia, the hemp, the sesame, turmeric. And then in the fruit department, we have 
pomegranate, kiwi, star fruit, blackberries. Those are probably the worst ones. And so it's not a huge list. It just happens to be, these are the cool kids. These are the popular ones. These are being promoted is oh so good for you, which is how I ended up with this title on the book. Like the foods we think are so great are actually the most toxic. So you said hemp, Chia. hemp, they, they're Chia. high. Yes. Wow. Wow. Chia wow. bowl is a good path to a kidney stone. Yes. Oh my gosh. Wow. <sighs> I don't know what I'm going to eat. <laughs> ah, more um, sardines. <laughs> can live on sardines. Yes. They're actually fantastic. And I've been living on them more because of this tendency to develop sensitivities because you're ruining the sort of barrier function of the gut and you're stimulating the immune system. Every time we eat these high oxalate foods, you cause damage to the immune cells in your bloodstream right away within a, less than an hour. Once One study that looked at this wow. tested the blood 40 minutes after a, a modest spinach smoothie and saw severe oxidative damage to the um, white blood cells in most of these subjects that was putting out this pro-inflammatory cytokines, like the cells themselves, now the immune cells themselves are damaged and they're crying for help from the other immune cells that aren't ruined yet by your, your spinach smoothie. So this is, uh, you end up with problems. And so I'm now um, seeming to not tolerate beef anymore. So I've upped my seafood. And I can tell you that I've now recognizing that and there's science there that has explaining this, that the omega-3s and the proteins in the fish, in the whole fish, like the sardine, is really good for muscle development. And so even though I'm almost 59, I have beautiful muscle definition that just seems to be improving on eating more sardines. So I've become like, whoa, man, sardines is like the secret to beauty. <laughs> well, that I'm going to switch it up because I know my husband eats them and we always have stacks of sardines. I guess I'll start eating some sardines. Um, There's like 20 varieties and brands too. So you just have fun trying all the ones and see which ones you like. Because as a kid, I, I used to love them. My mother used to oh, get cool. them and I used to love them. But so I guess I'll have to get start loving them again. They're so convenient. It, <laughs> when she, it's, it's an easy way to keep your weight good and, you know, your brain happier. It does improve the mood too. I find in my little social circle that people who struggle with with mood issues do really well if they start eating sardines on a regular basis so really what about yeah. soy soy i'm really cautious about soy i think it's a big problem and best of, avoided it's one of the top five allergens up there with corn and weed and eggs and mm -hmm. so on um and it has these other effects on the body i think when I was vegan, I was really overdoing the tofu. I was using that as a major protein. And I think that took the sort of helped me end my ovary health. I started having all kinds of reproductive health when I was eating all that tofu. Because it stimulates estrogen, right? Yeah. Overstimulates yeah. estrogen. Overstimulates it. And in a way that's just, I think, interrupting. It's also, I mean, without, between the oxalates and the soy and these things, you can start damaging your thyroid gland and even your pituitary and other glands in the body to the point where all kinds of communications and self-regulation of the body starts to falter, break down, and it leads to, you know, these more and more of this fatigue and aging that's for why, because we're unknowingly chemically harming our basic cell function and glandular function. Oh my gosh. Luckily, it's reversible. Like your body wants to heal and be well. And even at my ripe old age, you know, I continue to see signs that I'm continuing to recover from this. I just wish I had known this 30 years ago because mm -hmm. boy, I wouldn't have my spine wouldn't be quite the mess it's in. And I would have had, I would have a PhD, not just an MPH. I would have a, had a different career, a different income, a different level of choices in my life instead of always having to cope with the monkey of, struggling through fatigue and all these other health problems that I didn't understand what was wrong with me. Why did I have to have five or eight years of crutches and painkillers in my twenties? I mean, wow. it was such a waste. I never was able to do sports like I wanted to because my feet weren't right until I got on the low oxalate diet. And then lo and behold, I'm 50 years old. I can wear heels. I can run barefoot and my feet are like normal feet, but I spent 
most of my life unable to even go barefoot, let alone join an ultimate Frisbee club or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I joined a gym um, about six months ago and I've been working out, but I struggle because um, I just don't have the stamina right. to do it. So I'm going to start really paying attention to what you're saying. Well, uh, and one thing where you can get cardiovascular exercise and the anti-inflammatory effects of, of exercise by hanging out in the sauna. So join a gym that has a good sauna and, and get heat tolerant and, and start doing that heat stress and, and uh, sauna. And then you get the peripheral circulation opening up, you get the heart rate going up, you get a response to it that lowers inflammation in the vascular system. Those are all the things you're trying to get from exercise. You can do it by taking a nap in the sauna. So even if you're frail and don't have the stamina, you can benefit and increase your cardiovascular and other health parameters. I live in a sauna. My, oh, cool. <laughs> I live in South Florida and <laughs> hot and he, the summers hot and humid you you're out there for two minutes and you completely break into a sweat that's so I great guess i need to spend more time outside more time working in the yard <laughs> <clears throat> yes 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 um tell us about your book toxic superfoods well today's its birthday and it tries to answer all kinds of questions and it takes you from you know, what happened to me and, and the other examples of, and, and how easy it is like, well, quit eating spinach. That can't be a big, hard thing to do. And walks you through what's going on with the plants and how we got to this idea that plants are going to save us and, and gets a little bit into that debate. Like, mm, if you need to eat less spinach, that's fine. It's safe. It's good. Don't worry about it. It explains why we can't test for oxalates. It explains that oxalates accumulate in your body, which is why you wish you heard about it 20 years ago, because now you have 20 years of almonds and peanut butter and sweet potatoes having built up crystals in your bone marrow. That's where your blood cells are born, building up in your bones, making them imperfect and brittle and able to break more easily building up in your thyroid gland, this is not good. So the problem, what the book is explaining is the evidence for that, because science has been assuming that that crystal development in the tissues doesn't happen until after your kidneys fail, because your kidneys are eliminate, eliminating oxalate okay. primarily. A lot of it comes out through your urine, which is why you get jumpy bladder, irritable bladder, peeing a lot, waking up at night to pee, kidney stones. It's because the urinary tract is eliminating them. So there's a lot of confusion in science because we've been so focused on the kidney stone, which is made of oxalate. 80% of kidney stones are predominantly made of oxalate. And you have to have that material to build a kidney stone. And the main source of that material is your diet. Over 50% of what gets into your urine is coming strictly from your diet of potatoes and peanuts and so on. And so I address a lot of those confusions and kind of explain that and explain all the symptoms that can develop and how this can blow up into autoimmune problems, cancer, heart disease, you name it. It can blow up into many different, really common, strange, mysterious diseases it can be from wrecking your cells. That makes sense though, that if you got a poison that gets into your cells, messes up how the cell works, breaks the mitochondria and the subcellular organelles, is damaging the membranes. That's how it gets in there in the first place. So when you start messing with the basic cell function, anything can go wrong. And the book explains that and, and then teaches you how to get back out of this dangerously high consumption that we're, we've now, by promoting vegetables and spinach and almonds, we've really pushed ourselves into a danger zone of exposure. And you know the body can handle a little bit of oxalate, but it, compared to what we're eating, it's really a little bit. Um, and then how to get out of it and supplements you can use. So it's like trying to cover not just all your questions and explaining some of the science in a hopefully digestible way, but giving you lots of concrete suggestions for how to reverse all this. Uh, what about kale? Kale, yeah, <laughs> kale has its problems. It's not very digestible. It accumulates heavy metals, but it's not very high in oxalate. So if you eat it in modest amounts and cook it, 
uh, it's okay. But again, you can even overdo kale with the kale chips and the, this and that. It, it's, I'm not sure which street near Madison Avenue decided kale was a superstar, but <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> we've been sold a lot. We have been sold a real raw deal with these ideas about these super vegetables and how great they are. It's not really true. And and that's just, you know, I'm sure that people are listening to this and they're going, well, my God, what do I eat? I mean, because we're so used to this being our diet. I was, um, <clears throat> my husband and I were in Costco the other day and I was looking at all the foods around and I'm like, I can't eat that, I can't eat that, I can't eat that. And these are all trends because Costco brings in the trends. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I said, I can't wait for a few more years to see what the new trends are because I can't eat any of these trends. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and everything, you know, I mean, you want a little dessert, everything's got coconut or almond in it. I'm like, oh my God, it's like, I got to read labels. I, I've always been a label reader, but now I'm like, I scrutinize it, you know. Well, a trendy diet is definitely getting people in trouble and your body spoke up enough and you're listening to it. And that's the key message from my work is please stop listening to other people tell you what to eat and marketers marketing you foods. Listen to what's really going to be okay for your body. And that's hard to do. I mean, I tried for years. I didn't know it was a sweet potato. I would never have guessed that. But really, we need nutritious foods like the sardines. Now, if if there was a superfood, I would elect sardines and liver and these weird foods that nobody eats that are not trendy. Um, they don't have a lot of toxins. You want to be careful to source uh, seafood so it's low in mercury, that it's been tested for mercury. Right. Sardines, you don't want farm-raised, right? Well, farm-raised is not good because they're feeding them the wrong, you know, corn and these byproducts and they said so that you don't quite get the right omega-3s that you're looking for out of fish if it's farm raised there's also more pollution in those setups where they're uh, farm raising seafood so wild caught tested seafood but the little fish like the sardines is great and so the thing is we just haven't been really paying attention to which toxins we can handle and how much of them um, and that's the mistake so you want nutritious, real food that's not toxic. And we've been pretending that the toxin of oxalate and other phytonutrient, other phytochemicals you know, are okay. And we actually think they're good and they're not. Um, and that's really where the debate is. And I'm hoping that, that my work will, will just expose it in your own life. I mean, I've got the science to show it, but really matters is your body. If you're not flourishing on the things you're eating, then you need to question that. And it's okay if you have to eat for yourself because your best friend is your body. There's nobody in the world that matters more than your body. So, you know, are you going to abandon your best friend, the thing that's letting you have the life you live? No. So in a way, it's a spiritual question. How much am I going to be loyal to myself? Are women more prone to this than men to oxalate poisoning or is it equal? They are because women love their salads and they love dark leafy greens and they love to not gain weight. So they overload their lives with vegetables. Men who love potatoes tend to get kidney problems in the long run. And so that's their downfall. But men, many men historically before modern thinking were quite content with a steak or burger and a potato and they were done like they didn't need to load up their plates with 16 side dishes of different vegetables yeah. like we like to do and then when the wife is trying to make the husband healthy she starts insisting on more spinach salads and more vegetables and it gets worse <laughs> oh gosh i gotta love it what about did you, you mentioned wheat before is wheat bad Wheat um, is variable, and, and I am speculate in the book that one of the reasons wheat is variable, it's not just that there's hard wheat and soft wheat and different wheats and they're different growing years and so on that affect, because it's plants are natural things. And so like you and I are not identical. My sister and I is not identical. Even if I had identical twins, we'd be different. We'd have different tastes and interests and so on. So there's variability in plants based on their growing conditions and so on. But the variability in wheat that makes it like, well, you got to kind of limit how much wheat you're eating anyway, because of the starch and it's just not really that nutritious. Mm -hmm. But from an oxalate standpoint, some wheat is moldier than other wheats. 
in the harvesting and the storage process, um, aspergillus mold is this black mold that produces oxalate, can start growing in the wheat and in fruits and other foods. And that potentially adds oxalate to those foods. So the if it hasn't been properly handled or it was a wet year or whatever, there may be more oxalate in wheat, a wheat batch because of mold contamination. Hmm. And I guess that could happen with organic wheat as well. More likely. And, and that's the, the problem with almonds is that they, mm. they almonds get shaken out of the trees. They lay on the ground. They get picked up by these mechanical harvesters that pick up all this dirt and heavy metals and mold from the soil. And then they put them in piles on the ground in, under a tarp where mold will grow. And so they would normally fumigate the almonds and these things with antifungals and things to lower that. But with organic, you can't use the chemicals on it. So your chances of doing that kind of industrial scale organic, you just get more mold. So true organic is sort of a hand-picked process that's so carefully taking care of the harvest process and the, and the whole from A to B to Z. You've got hand care instead of this industrial scale using piles and equipment and so on that's more toxic, more dirty. So good to know. Wow, what an education you're giving us. Um, yeah, you mentioned quinoa before. I'm, I'm, I can't eat quinoa. I love it, but I can't eat it. I have a problem with that. Um, and see, that's got saponins in it too. That You know how if you rinse quinoa, it has like soap, like on the top of the water. Those saponins help to dissolve your membrane. So they increase the leakiness of your gut. Oh my gosh. And it's really high in oxalate. The combination of saponins and oxalate is the perfect way to kill cells because the two of them together help break down the cell membrane and allow oxalate to get in there. And it really messes up the cell function. So, so quinoa, quinoa, I used to like quinoa, you know, because I'm on this wheat free thing and taff and buckwheat, you know, noodles. It's like <laughs> buckwheat is also a terrible. Problem. I'm blown. I'm blown away by all these things. And I'm here. I'm thinking something's wrong with me because I'm having problems with all these things. And everybody else is saying they're great and they're wonderful and they're healthy. Um, you mentioned before. That's, it's so important. You know, I just have to put a point on that. Like, it's not you. You're not broken as a. You were designed fine. It's the it's the world you're living in is breaking you down, and it's not something where you're naturally defective you're just trying to do the right thing and the right thing isn't the right thing um, you mentioned before in your that in your book you talk about supplements the supplements well i'm going to ask you what supplements you recommend but um do the supp supplements counteract what we're eating or do they eliminate it from the toxins from our body the body does the healing and does the elimination and you there's not a magic bullet that does it for the body that's really a physiologic job the body has to be well nourished well rested and not have additional toxins causing it to be in defensive mode so if you take out the the toxins like the oxalate let's stay with the oxalate you take out the oxalate eventually the body starts clearing it out itself at a pace that's hopefully okay if it's too fast a pace, you're going to get more toxic and sicker than you were when you were eating this stuff because it takes immune activation to get rid of it. So it increases inflammation, which is supposed to be short bursts and temporary because inflammation is like a little war and it has the civilians get killed in war. You know, it's a mess when you start having a war. So the inflammation is supposed to be very targeted and brief. Mm -hmm. If you full of toxic particles all through your glands and bones, it's gonna cause chronic inflammation. And you can have a, you know, a decade more of more chronic inflammation because you're now loaded with these toxic crystals. So the important thing is to watch the process, understand what it looks like from symptoms and contain that process by not going too low, too long. Like you might need a little oxalate to tell the body to slow down this detox process. And we use supplements to help, it does help protect the kidneys and help dissolve the crystals. The citric acid is the main tool 
for helping to soften these crystals, which are hard like quartz. There's enough citric acid nearby. It softens them, makes them more like chalk, and it prevents them from growing into big kidney stones and really protects you from kidney stones. So we use citric acid minerals because you're also losing a lot of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and minerals. So you become very mineral deficient from a high oxalate diet. So you need to replace those missing minerals, but you also will keep losing minerals as this inflammation removes the crystals from the tissue. So you have to keep adding them back in. In fact, calcium seems to help the body remove. This is really calcium citrate is the main magic bullet for, for helping the body remove oxalate. But some people, they take calcium and it tells the body, yay, I can get rid of oxalate. And then it's too eager. It's so sick of being full of particles. It's wants them gone. And so sometimes you have to add back in, like if you've gone really low oxalate, people move all the way to full carnivore diet, which is great for the gut and gets rid of all these plant -y toxins, but it can be so low in oxalate and, and so nutriently available. They're like you can actually get the nutrients from meats easily. You're designed for that 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 promotes this clearing. And so sometimes after a while on, a, on a, even the full meat diet, these oxalate symptoms come back. So the key thing is yes, calcium citrate is important as are potassium citrate, magnesium citrate. These can be very important using lemon juice. That's the main natural source of citric acid. You a Half a cup of lemon juice is supposedly enough to help dissolve kidney stones. So I often recommend people juice a lemon in the morning and the evening and, and a big lemon to get a quarter cup twice a day or three smaller lemons throughout the day. But that can be really, really helpful. It also lowers this acidity caused by all this inflammation. Every time you're mucousy and not feeling good, you're probably getting kind of acidic because this inflammation creates this acidic situation and the body's correcting that all the time. But the way the body corrects that is to dissolve your bones. The bones immediately start releasing minerals to keep your calcium levels up and keep your acidity under control. And we, we have to control that very carefully. It's not good to leave that raging acidity. So the, the other benefit of the lemon juice and the citric acid is it is actually alkalizing to the body. Wow. So those are the main tools is some citric acid, either lemon juice or these supplements with minerals in them. The minerals are alkalizing. The citric acid turns to bicarbonate in the liver. That's why it's alkalizing. Mm -hmm. So those are really simple tools. Those are the, the diet, the lemons, the citric acid, you know, the, the calcium, magnesium, and, and potassium citrates, some trace minerals. There's more we can do. Some people are deficient in B1. That's a very common problem. That's helpful to restore high levels of B1 in the body. Some people need a B complex. There aren't many good ones out there, um, but it, it's pretty simple, really. And then, you know, I I have this connective tissue damage from the oxalates that's still affecting my spine. I have pits and holes in my vertebral bodies. I have oh stenosis and I have bone spurs and I have facet joint arthritis and flattened discs and like the whole spine is in trouble. And I find that if I take BioCell, which is this bioavailable silica that turns on, it seems to stabilize my back and lower my back pain. So there's things like that. There's other supplements available like that that can help people feel better, do better and recover better. But none of them are like doing it for you. It's, your, it's about prompting the body, giving it the tools it needs to do the healing work. What was the name of that bio what? SIL for silica, it's bio Biosil, and that's a supplement, yeah. right? It is, it comes in a liquid form or a pill form. And I, I got lazy about doing the little drops every day. And, but then I've been paying for that with the increased back pain. And I finally, as my, my big New Year's resolution this year was to get back on the bio cell. And within a day and a half of taking it, the back pain is like, more That's than amazing. A lot of people have back problems. Back and problems. I blame oxalate for a lot of it because it's such an intricate, it's so important. I mean, it's your major structure that holds the whole body together and it's running your central nervous system and all the nerves are coming out of your spine. It's so critical and it's a complicated, amazing design and oxalates go break down connective tissue and they can get in the discs and ruin the discs and they can break down that bone of the structure. So yeah, and 
Back pain and neck pain is a very common symptom of oxalate problems. Hmm. Hmm. Everybody's ears are perking up. <laughs> I know. Oh, it doesn't oh have God. either back pain, arthritis, or digestive problems, hmm. or now new reactivities to things. These are becoming really common. And luckily, the solution is easy have more meat, let, uh, curate the vegetables. Like there's still plenty of greens and vegetables if you really love those foods. There's plenty of them. You still need to moderate that too. I mean, more is not always better. And that's part of our cultural problem. We think if a little bit's fine or good, that more is better. And this is a great example of how wrong that mentality is. I love cabbage and Brussels sprouts. Are they good? Yeah, they are. Cabbage is incredibly low in oxalate, much lower than the Brussels sprout, inversatile. And if it's not bothering your digestion, if it's agreeing with you, that's an example of something I've become allergic to. So I haven't been, but I have some really great cabbage recipes in my PDF cookbook on my website because oh. I do like cabbage and it's versatile and it can be delicious if you know how to cook it and you can make a nice sauerkraut with it too. It's, it's right. cabbage is a, is a, old timey vegetable in that humans have really relied on it a lot, you know, like with the sauerkraut and so on. And, and cauliflower, that's like the new trend too. Is that, all, is that okay? It's all part of, these are all the same family of vegetables. The, these are all the cruciferous or the cabbage family vegetables, and they're all pretty low in oxalate. Brussels sprouts are a little on the high end. So if you boil them first and then roast them or do whatever you want to do, you can help them a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But they're not bad. If you, you know, again, in a reasonable portion. <laughs> Everything in a reasonable portion. Um, <laughs> so you were talking about um, detoxing. So, so we don't want to just eliminate everything at one time because we'll get detox symptoms and we won't feel well, right? Right. So we want to start doing it moderately, little by little, right? Yeah, pick a food like the spinach or the Swiss chard that you can live without and just stop buying that one for a while. And then, you know, get around to get, you can hang on a little bit to whatever one. People tend to be hooked on their chocolate or their sweet potatoes or their potatoes or their beets. So you can wait on those. But in the meantime, just keep your portions reasonable. Uh, eventually you'll be getting rid of them. But sometimes you need a little bit back in. So, you know, if you if you still want a few tablespoons of sweet potatoes, you may be able to do that in the long term, even. Uh, everybody's journey is different and everybody's body is different. But uh, sometimes you get rid of the oxalates from the diet and the body starts um, releasing oxalates. So your oxalate levels are high in the blood after you stop eating them. And a little bit of an oxalate food can be a little too much. So you have to... In the book, I have a chart in the back that gives you very specific portion sizes for certain amounts of oxalate. So you can start playing around and judge how much of it you're tolerating. There's um, a lot of tables and charts in the book to help you figure things out and customize. Because I want you to be as flexible as you want to be with your diet and find the things you can eat. And, you know, it, everyone has to really customize it. So I don't have like, oh, this is exactly how to do this. It's, no, you're going to figure this out honoring your body and honoring what you tolerate and honoring you, what you want to eat. Um, you mentioned beets. So beets are high in oxalates too? Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing Not me. Not as bad as the greens. So just get rid of the greens first and then oh, let me sour the beet content. I know beets can be fun. I used to make beet kvass and I liked beets my whole life. Um, celery, is that okay? Only in small amounts. Yeah. Small but it's, amounts. you can use celery and carrots to make soup because you're not that much for the portion size. So it's not about totally eliminating the food. It's about getting your dose of oxalate down to something that's not going to hurt you anymore. What about juicing? If we juice. Uh, things, yeah. Not good. It's a great way to liberate oxalic acid and other plant compounds and dilute them in a fluid so that it can get right into your bloodstream even faster and more, more of it. Oh, I've gotten such bad advice. <laughs> That's why I needed to write the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I just, um, I got, because supposedly when you juice, it's good for the gut bacteria. <laughs> 
and she's laughing and she's <laughs> laughing at me because it's not okay um I, cal um citric acid is added to a lot of it's uh, everywhere as a food, food additive yeah because right. it's a preservative yeah right so if it's it's, it's, you if know it, you tolerate it if you're tolerating regular food it's everywhere so you can feel free to experiment with citric acid ci citrate supplements because you're it's the same stuff it's made in factories and there's like four or five factories in china that make most of it and some some people have extremely sensitive systems that have a radar for mold, mold allergy and so there's a small percentage of people very small who can't do citric acid commercially or even are having histamine reactions because of all this immune activation. Their mast cells are crazy, so they can't tolerate the lemons. Don't worry about it. There's still tools that you can use to help yourself feel better. My, that's what my reaction is, mostly histamine. It it's sounds like your immediate. mast cells are very on edge and they're very viciously trying to protect you from stuff. So this, they hang out on the surfaces of the whole intestinal tract, the mouth, the throat, the lungs. I mean, the... right after I eat, it just starts. I mean, yeah. my throat just starts producing all this um, phlegm and the globus and the, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm clearing my throat and all that. Kind of, and I know a lot of people do that. Um, so yep. and it's a histamine reaction. So that the uh, oxalates could be kicking off the histamine reaction. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's that. There's a another piece of the puzzle for me because I've been searching. <laughs> sorry, I've been searching for answers. Well, um, it'll be fun to see your journey over the next five to ten years. I just started my tenth year on the diet, and I and I'm so much better, and I'm still recovering, still recovering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit older than you are, and um. So it's been in me for a long time, but um, you know I'm I'm very disciplined when it comes to eating. If I know it's going to be good for me, so you and sound so much like my clients, and many of my clients are in their seventies and having miraculous things happening for their health. I can't this. wait because <laughs> me I, too. I don't it's feel so great. It's so fun to see people get better. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like I don't have the stamina. Um, that I should have. And I'm like, why? <laughs> I do everything right. Um, so anyway, it, this is really, really good. Uh, okay. Was there anything that you wanted to tell us that I didn't cover, Sally? Well, I, I, mostly um, just exhale, you know, because <laughs> these people have strong reactions to this, either because they're so devoted to their current way of thinking that anybody who questions their current way of thinking just makes them angry. And the rest of us who are like, oh man, I've just ruined my health for how many decades? Uh, it's It can be crushing information. And this isn't the last thing I wanna do is emotionally upset anybody and either from either end. The truth is that if we don't look at this we're in danger of not just hurting our health, but our family's health, the children, the grandchildren. You're going to misfeed the people you love for the, you know, you're trying to do right by them. And to finally have some more truthful information gives you so much power. You can ignore it if you wish. And I have no interest in jamming information down people's throats. But if you really want to be well and do right by your family, this is important to look into are you um i mean you must have done an incredible amount of research how long did it take you to write this book <laughs> it, it a lot of years of research and then scratching my head over everything and trying to put it together and figure out what it was telling me it took a, a lot of you know head cracking work to like it was often emotional at the library i spent a lot of time i would send every sunday in the medical library we have a great one here where I live. It's a really nice library. It's been there a long time. They have an old collection so I can get into the old research because the, the diagnosis of oxalate poisoning began in 1842. Hmm. We've had a diagnosis that you could harm your health with dietary oxalates for a hundred years from 1840s to around the 1940s. And then it got dropped. Um, so wow. there's a lot of interesting stuff and really a lot of the pre-1980s literature is better science. 
the techniques and and it's basic science. It's a lot more truth in there versus modern science, which is about producing products and justifying your research because we can come up with a supplement or a drug or something. And so it's the older science is better. So I really enjoy having the old literature, but it took a lot. And then to figure out how to explain it and then jam it down into one little book. Uh, and it's not a little book, but it's little compared to the topic. <laughs> the book could have been at least 50% longer. There's a lot not in there just because you're not going to keep reading forever. I didn't want to create a, a doorstop. This is a living book to try to help you get started. And, and it, it, it did take phenomenal. years. Took years. And, yes. and it's not perfect. I know there's a few mistakes in there here and there, but it's good enough. Let's just move forward and help ourselves. I know. I mean, I, I'm a writer. I have books out there. And um, the editing, I mean, you can, no matter how many times you edit a book, you're going to find mistakes. It's just impossible to get them all. Well, and for me, the sad part is you spend so much time trying to craft a message where people can understand what you're trying to tell them in a readable way that it takes you away from the deeper thinking and updating the science, you know? So like there's always the science, I'm a science geek. So the science geek in me is always frustrated that it, it takes so many years just to craft the message. So it's understandable uh, that it takes you away from really wanting to keep perfecting the scientific message and get that as right as we can get. We're, we're very imperfect in our knowledge. So true. Yeah. Um, so we really, are there any other books on this topic that are currently out? There's just a few, uh, you know, sort of self-published books that haven't had the, you know, the rigorous treatment and that doesn't have this complete scientific treatment. So okay. this is, so this is really the book, the book, the book. Yeah. Okay. Toxic superfoods. So, um, so your, uh, website is sallynorton.com. Sally K. Norton. There is Sally a Sally Norton out there. She's a bariatric surgeon. She's not me. So she has her. <laughs> That's one reason why we're featuring K in, in my logo in pink, because it we got to remember the K to find okay, the right. Sally K. Norton.com. And you're on YouTube and social media. Um, Instagram. At SK Norton at Toxic Superfoods. Yeah, so I have two book. accounts there because the SK Norton one was stolen by hackers in March and it took three painful weeks to fight for it and get it back. So oh in the meantime, gosh. I started another one for the book. Um, and, and since then, my heart, with all the effort it takes to create a post and try to, it's, a, it's another writing project, each little post. And so mm -hmm. I kind of lost my heart for spending all that time. <laughs> I know it's I really, really important really to reach me through my website because at any point social media could disappear. I have a website's a little more stable way to communicate. So if you're trying to reach me, reach me through the website okay. and get on my email list so that you can, you know, I can let you know if, if some things get hacked or something goes wrong or something good happens, like, Hey, today's the birthday of the book. Then I can let you know. Okay. That sounds amazing. So Sally K Norton .com. Um, well, well, I know I learned some amazing things today, Sally, that I would not have come across. And this is a godsend for me because I am constantly, I mean, since the age of 19, I have been researching and researching and trying and trying and doing and eliminating. And, you know, I've been doing this for so many years. It would be really nice to find the answer. I'm hoping this is it. I'm suspecting it's a most likely explanation. And I cannot tell you how thrilled it makes me to find one more person who's going to really, <laughs> really benefit from knowing. <laughs> so thank you for taking the time to learn yeah, a little bit about Of course. This. Okay, Sally, take care. It's been great. Thank you very much. You take care. Okay. Happy New Year. Same to you.